Here we go. Awesome. Here we go. Thank Great. You. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it looks like it's time to begin. I want to welcome everyone to the Innovative Public Service Pedagogy to Foster Enhanced Social Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Conference Track. My name is Jade Barry James. I'm the Vice Chair of the Standing Panel on Social Equity and Governance, as well as a Professor of Public Administration at North Carolina State University, where I have the current pleasure of serving as Chair of the Faculty. Our title proposed for this particular session is called A Guided Discussion, Using Research Opportunities to Develop Graduate Student Competencies in Social Equity. Before I tell you a little bit more about the panel, I, will, I would love to introduce uh, my, fa my favorite panelists. We have, let's see, in the bottom of your screen to the right, we have Whitney Brown, who's an MPA uh, graduate from the L. Douglas Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs at Virginia Commonwealth University. On the bottom left of my screen, we have also Keandra Davis, who's a PhD student in the L. Douglas Wilder Graduate School um, at VCU. In my uh, top left, we have Carl Wesslin, who is a first year graduate MPA student at North Carolina State University. And we have up at the top row to the right, Ms. Paige Moore, MSW. Ms. Moore is um, a doctoral student at North Carolina State University in the Department of Public Administration, and she is pursuing um, her doctoral studies while um, also preparing for your comp exams, right, Paige? So as you might imagine, this is a unique group of students that we have in front of us today. And essentially we um, organized this panel to really explore how graduate assistantships and other applied research opportunities expose students to social equity through guided teaching methods, some of which include a review of the literature. Um, that's really one of the first assignments I always offer a, re a research assistant, um, the application of research methods, which sometimes include data collection and analysis, as well as student-centered pedagogy to enhance their understanding across the dimensions of social equity, diversity, and inclusion. So just to prepare for the conference, I've asked the panelists, will they describe how their learning experiences as research assistants have reinforced their learning outcomes using guided research um, in social equity and social policy. So through discussion today, I hope that they will be able to share how applied lessons learned further how they explore dimensions of equity and develop competence, particularly in social equity. Um, during, the, during the panel, I hope that they will also talk about their applied work, uh, particularly how their work strengthens their commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the field of public administration. So I wanna give you some insight. We've organized this discussion as a guided one, so much so that we're asking the panelists to reflect on the following questions. First question is, in what ways have you learned about social equity, diversity, and inclusion as a graduate student in public affairs, public policy, and public administration programs? The second question is, how was your role as a graduate student broadened, how has it broaden your understanding of principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion in our field. The third is in your experiences as a graduate student, research assistant, or teaching assistant, do you experience a sense of belonging while conducting this kind of research with your professor, mentor, or supervisor? The fourth question was reflecting back on your experiences, what lessons have you learned? Particularly, how did your research experiences help you relate or connect with others in your field? And then the fifth question, how has your role reinforced your competence, awareness, understanding, and commitment to social equity in our field? And if so, how and why? So we'll get started. Um, we'll start with um, the first question, as long as my panelists are ready. Yeah, excellent. So I'd like to start with um, Whitney, if you will. 
Whitney is a recent graduate of the Wilder School, just recently received her MPA. Whitney, will you talk a little bit about what you're doing currently? Sure. So yes, as Dr. Barry said, I just recently graduated from the Wilder School um, at Virginia Commonwealth University. And my perspective, I really consider myself a practitioner researcher. So um, I've been more in the practice like, you know, the practitioner space for most of my life. Currently, I serve as chief of staff for Richmond City Council, first, first voter district, where I help develop a lot of the policy. Um, I respond to constituent concerns, and I develop, like, legislation for the city of Richmond. So it's a very versatile role. Um, I do a lot of things as needed. And even before that, um, I was a full-time student, and we're still working full-time. I was a police officer before um, going from undergrad to graduate school. So I kind of took some time to actually, you know, gain some professional experience. And, you know, I really never heard of social equity or even diversity, equity, and inclusion a lot until about 2014 at Penn State University. And mm -hmm. I think when everybody's introduced to social equity, um, especially, you know, you have that image in your head of all the different people standing on the different size boxes and it's like equity, equality, you know, that, that whole like kind of foundational base. Um, you know, I, I knew a lot about racial, racial issues growing up and intersectionality, but never really social equity. So just learning about that, um, I really learned a lot about that in graduate school at the Wilder School with Dean Gooden, who was like, a leader in social social and racial equity. So just using that as the baseline and as the foundation of all of my research, all of my all of the things I practice and all of my work has really helped hone in on, you know, just the many complexities that I face as a black woman that, you know, and also it helps me check my biases and my privilege too, because I think everybody benefits from something even if they're unaware of it. And I hope that's a great start to answering that question. Yeah, thanks so much, Whitney. Paige, I'm going to pivot with you. Pivot to you. I know that in your MSW work, you've done some work with police officers. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of the things that you've learned, particularly either as an MSW student or as a student in public administration um, currently. Yeah, so um, I have done. I've actually worked with um, police officers, as Dr. Barry James said. I. Um, I had my, so I did my second in your MSW field. Um, you've got to actually go out, you do like 24 hours. And so um, when I graduated with my MSW, my very first day working as a social work consultant for the police department was the day after George Floyd was murdered. And my job was to um, engage with community leaders and build relationships, which is very difficult to do when there's um, a lot of rioting and interacting downtown um, between protesters and police officers, that was a very, very difficult and challenging time to try and engage with in community building and relationship building um, when you're meeting with people that got gassed the night before, right? And, and you want then the police are telling you to, you know, tell, give the message and convey the message to the community that we really care. That's a very difficult thing to do. Um, so right after that, I came into the PhD program. And so that was the beginning of my first year. And, you know, coming from social work and then having like, you know, worked with police officers and writing um, what I would I would I would classify as very progressive policies um, for the police department. I really thought that I knew a lot. And then I uh, my mentor is actually Dr. Barry James. And so Dr. Barry James really opened my eyes to how much I didn't know and that I had, you know, that this um, this diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging, um, this journey is it's a lifelong process. And, you know, you walk into spaces that it's more of like a sliding scale, like some spaces, you know, more, some spaces that, you know, less. Um, but this is a really a lifelong journey, a lifelong commitment um, to um, diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging. Thank you so much, Paige. And thanks for the compliment also. I appreciate that. I want to pivot, if you will, to Keandra. Keandra, again, is a, a doctoral student at uh, VCU. Keandra, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your experiences before you joined the PhD program, the experiences in the community that you had. 
Yeah, so for me, like before um, joining at BCU, so I'm originally from Miami, Florida. Um, so I just, you know, kind of moved up to this site recently last August. Um, and yeah, I've, I've had a, a lot of experience, um, mostly like legislation, mm -hmm. um, working with the state, state um, house representatives in Florida, um, up in Tallahassee and doing like other campaign work. Um, and, you know, specifically in areas like Miami, you know, it's, it's very diverse. It's like, you know, it's often considered the melting pot, you know, because you just, you have so many cultures from all over um, that are, you know, trying to thrive. They're opening businesses. And so you face like a lot of like disadvantages. And so I, I think, I think it's really important, like just having that representation. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's nice, it's nice to have um, like leaders in those places that can kind of represent those voices that we often, you know, we, we, we don't see. Um, and policy doesn't support those voices. Um, and so it's, it's, it was nice to just like do work, do work like that um, in the community with those leaders um, that supported the community, like they, they supported the community through their policy initiatives, through policies um, that they were on their agendas. And specifically for me, when I first heard about um, social equity, kind of like some of the, the panelists shared, like it's not something that you learn about um, you know, in college and in the in institutions, but it's so important, especially in the policy field. Um, and for me, it was taking um, a social equity course in my MPA program. And that was actually as an elective. Um, and I, let's yeah. talk about that later. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, um, I learned a lot about it. And just, you know, we talked about a lot of just social inequities, mm -hmm. you know, like ableism and housing, criminal justice. And just, it was just nice. We even did a lot of exercises um, of like on privilege and all those things. And so we learned a lot about how we all um, have, you know, some privileges over others, um, um, you know, whether some may be visible or invisible. Um, we mm -hmm. wrote, even wrote out um, like stereotypes um, and different things. So it was just nice to kind of share, have that space where we could all share and learn and grow together and know that, you know, again, like we've all been, we all have like policy, all these things have been socially constructed and we're all socialized. And as a result, like the way that we see the world, it's, 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 it's narrow, it's, 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 it can be very limited. And so it's important to expose ourselves, um, you know, to social equity and DEI and all the things that come with it. So I'm really happy that um, we're having these conversations a lot more. And I think it's important that we sort of put ourselves in those spaces where they be through volunteering opportunities um, in our jobs or just like um, being vocal about it if you don't see it happening enough um, where you work um, or again the place where you volunteer at so really excited um, for this panel. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Keandra. You know, by way of association, I just want to let you know that you and Carl are from the same state. So I'm going to pivot a little bit to Carl. Carl, talk a little bit about, um, now Carl is a, a first year MPA student at North Carolina State University. Would you talk a little bit about um, what you've learned um, since you've been in graduate school? Certainly. So I honestly had never heard the expression DEI before I went to NCSU. I went straight from undergraduate in Michigan, and I had heard the term equity, but never DEI. And they never went in depth into what equity is. But immediately when I went to NCSU in my first classes, the syllabuses mentioned equity, and achieving diversity in the field, expanding diversity. And even still in the first semester, it wasn't super big to me because it hadn't been put in. But in my second semester, I started working with Dr. Barry James. And that's when I started really understanding DEI and its importance, seeing how there is great gaps in our society and problems with equity is a real thing that us as public administrators need to work to lessen or better that gap in equity. So, so far in just one year as a MPA student at NCSU, my knowledge has increased from nothing to it being something I consider important and something I will consider once I become a professional. And that's what I think is my big takeaway from one year at NCSU so far. 
Thank you so much, Carl. Thanks for the compliment also. Um, I will say that we're gonna pivot to our next question really, which talks about your role as a graduate student. Um, when I was an undergraduate student, I worked for the New Jersey Department of Higher Education for the Educational Opportunity Fund Program. It was there at the age of 20 that I learned about equity, particularly um, equity in higher education, the way in which we provide resources for people who are educationally and economically disadvantaged to allow them to sort of um, look through the window of opportunity to allow administrators to open that window of opportunity to allow all of us to sort of go through that window of opportunity and really pursue some of our educational dreams. I want to, I wonder if you would talk a little bit um, as a graduate student, really talk about um, the experiences that you've had, um, just in terms of some of the research experiences or um, some of the projects that you were worked on, um, some of your own research that you plan to do as you continue your educational endeavor. So I'm going to start with Paige, if that's okay, only because I'm a little bit more familiar with some of her research. So Paige, if you could talk about your very first conference, the one that you, you, you presented in, um, can you tell us a little bit about that and what your research was all about? Um, my very, so my very first conference was, um, yeah, so my very first conference was my fall of my, uh, PH was the beginning of my PhD and I presented at the, um, Black Doctoral Network and I'm not sure for those of you that aren't familiar, it's actually a really great conference. Um, if you have the chance to go, it's, it's online, they're going to be holding it again here in the fall and I think that they hold two a year. Um, but I presented a poster on, um, I presented on, uh, um, uh, officers at the within the Raleigh Police Department and recruitment and retention rates and the differences in race and gender and how long office stay um, over the course of their career. And so looking at, I pulled data from um, after the uh, president's task force on 21st century policing, because you know when the president's task force came in, there's lots of different community policing things that were involved in training. So there were some really big differences. Um, so looking at how long are officers staying after they have the opportunity to get through their um, their training and um, and then uh, how long until they have to get through their field, um, which is like the the FTO, the field training. Um, Whitney knows who I'm talking about, but I'm trying to, but um, I'm sure. But uh, so how long how long do they actually stay after they get through all of their training? And so what I was looking at is there's a there is a direct correlation, specifically in that department. I can't speak to all departments, but um, the broader literature shows that the might this hypothesis might be correct in other departments, um, but that specifically women and people of color are um, that are officers within police departments or this specific police department are not um, staying as long as um, officers who are white and officers who are male, and also that there is a correlation between how far an officer has to travel um, to get to their actual their their station and um, how long they're going to stay. So looking at like their different experiences and then also looking at the culture within the overall police department, how that contributes to if an individual wants to stay at that police department and if they feel like they belong. Um, so that's a that's a lot of um, that's a lot of infor information there about that. Um, what was the second part of your question, Dr. Barry James? I'm sorry. Well, I, I think I can talk about that forever. <laughs> I think I think you did. I, I think you described the conference and you described mm -hmm. your research at the conference. And so that was great. Thank you, Paige. Thank you. I want to pivot to Whitney because one of the things that I do know about the VCU MPA program is that you often have to do a culminating project. Is that right, Whitney? And could you talk a little bit about your project? Sure. Group based, um, and we don't choose it, so we don't really choose our topic. So, what the school does is they kind of recruit organizations or different agencies, and they kind of have an issue or some type of problem that they want us as students to analyze. Mm -hmm. So, this year, my group and I, we worked with the VCU MD, um, PhD program, so mm -hmm. medical science training program. I don't know how familiar you are, you all are with that, but basically students um, who are trying to get their doctorate as well, not their doctorate, but their medical degree as well as their PhD. So mm -hmm. kind of a researcher practitioner type of deal. 
Um, and they really had issues with their student surveying. Um, they didn't really know how they should be surveying their students. Mm -hmm. And they really wanted to find ways to get effective feedback so that they could implement programmatic changes um, that benefited their students in the program holistically. And one of the things that you know we did with that is we got to take a lot of our theories that we learned throughout our uh, master of public administration coursework and kind of you know help them solve that problem. So one of one of the frameworks that we really use um, was a social equity framework because we looked at like their students that they had and like we talked to some of the students and looked at their surveying practices, the way they worded questions. And, mm -hmm. you know, we didn't really feel like that the way that they surveyed students was conducive or effective in getting the feedback that they were looking for. So that's the kind of thing that we helped them out with. And to answer your other questions, some other research I also did um, with ECU is when I went to ASPA, actually, I presented on local government transitions. So mm -hmm. Virginia is a state that has an election every year. Um, we're one of two states where our governor cannot serve consecutively. So every four years we have a new governor. And I got to work during a transition year for our governor's office. And just to see like but it made me realize just the problems that they have, especially with you know planning for that next year from when that next governor transitions. And to me, that was also another equity issue because I felt like a lot of the background workers like myself were ignored. They weren't really thought of, you know, everybody else who were in higher cabinet level positions, they knew what they were going to do. But, you know, workers like myself who are essential to that workplace and do a lot of the work, we, we really don't know, you know, we don't have a backup plan. And so just like researching some of those issues, any state, local, um, or federal government entity. Awesome. Okay, thank you, Whitney. I was having a little bit of um, technical issue. I'm, I don't know if it's on my end or your end, but we just keep talking through it and usually we connect back with each other. So I just want to point that out. I'm um, going to pivot, if you will, to Keandra because Keandra, you also had some applied work the summer before you began your PhD. Could you talk a little bit about um, that work that you did with the Research Institute for Social Equity at VCU? Yep, so with my time with um, RISE, we got to look at COVID-19 deaths. Um, and so kind of, um, you know, being contracted out with the Virginia Department of Health, and we wanted to explore vaccine hesitancy. So like we all know, you know, going through the pandemic, uh, we had communities, many communities, you know, that were vaccine hesitant. Um, but when we, when we looked at the death population, um, it was disproportionately high, death rates were significantly higher in Black and, and Latino communities. Um, and so that's what a lot of our, our work did, um, doing interviews and just trying to understand, um, you know, what were some reasons behind the, the vaccine hesitancies, considering considering um, death rates that existed in these populations. And just, you know, like we said, from an equity perspective, like we know that, um, or like we, we found out um, in our research that, you know, a lot of people didn't have access um, to, to tests, you know, they didn't have, didn't have access um, to just like even proper information to, you know, get vaccinated. And so just a lot of, a lot of issues, like I know in some of the interviews, some of the um, our, you know, interviewees would say, you know, they don't want to get the vaccine, you know, it's too soon, they're very uncertain. Uh, but because of their jobs, if their jobs required the vaccine, then they would get they would get it, you know, same thing with their children. Um, and so yeah, like just like looking at looking at, at um, some of the work that we did from an equity perspective, like you definitely saw many of those barriers for um, just like people of color, um, with again, like getting getting vaccinated, um, access to uh, access to care, like we also found that just like distance, you know, yeah. a lot of vaccine centers were really far away um, from, you know, just like in the community. And so I, I just I always think to me my, to myself, just like personally, there's so many facilities and community centers that can be used um, like within communities and especially those that don't have proper transportation. Um, and so I think just practically um, trying to like um, trying to find like better practical solutions and practical me measures. Um, to really help those marginalized groups, I think is really important. But I really enjoyed the work that we did with RISE, um, like looking at um, um, vaccinations and COVID-19 deaths, um, really great work. 
Thanks, Keontra. Thanks for sharing a little bit more about that work that you did with the Research Institute for Social Equity at VCU. That's a new entity and it's up and coming for sure. Carl, I want to pivot, with, pivot to you for a minute. Um, Along the same lines in terms of, you know, describing for us some of the research that you did. So I know for a fact that before I met you, you worked for um, Jeffrey Diebold, who um, is a department chair in the uh, Department of Public Administration in the School of Public and International Affairs. Could you talk a little bit about the work that you did for Dr. Diebold, particularly the research that you did with him? Certainly. So my work with Dr. Diebold, it didn't really have a DEI spin in any way, but it was still nice work. Um, it was more administrative work. I, he would give me tasks to do, like he'd say, look at the top 80 MPA programs and mm -hmm. get me a list of their staff. Uh, if they have a four plus one program, how many assistant professors they have to assist him when he wanted to argue for the department getting a four plus one program or more assistant professors. But I still learned a little bit about equity while doing that because when looking over the programs, I'd get to see the program's mission statements and a lot of them did mention equity. So I'd get to see that it is an important thing in our field that programs across the country are taking actions to try to do better on compared to before. And I think that's just a good experience with mm -hmm. Dr. Diebold. Yeah, would you like to talk a little bit about your experience in the with the Farm to Early Care and Education program, some of the research experience that you worked on with me? Yes. So, at the start of the spring semester, I was reassigned to Dr. Barry James, and it was a big shift, as I mentioned previously, to how I had never heard of really DEI in any way, to immediately going into DEI intensive research with the Farm to Early Care and Education program, which seeks to create communities of practice in areas in North Carolina at risk for food insecurity, historically underserved communities, those usually are. And the program wants to have these communities work to get together to deliver healthy, fresh foods to um, children, learning care centers and educate the children and parents and everyone involved on how to make a healthier living for these underserved communities. And I assisted with that by looking over data since 2017 for the program. And I would see there's 19 variables and I would look into how it's changed to see if it was doing well. And most of them were doing pretty good, I'd say. So it was good to see that DEI programs do have a positive effect and they are making a positive change in our communities. And since then, I've done further work with it to help you with the final evalu evaluation. Am I allowed to talk about that since it's well, not done yet? Well, <laughs> thanks a lot, Carl. <laughs> yes, it's not done yet, but you could, if you have some observations that you want to share, I mean, certainly the final report isn't written, but sharing those observations would be great. Mm -hmm. Or talking about the work that you actually did, you know, what you did kind of thing. Yeah. So... I think this is an important one. Mm -hmm. I was, I'm helping to make data tables for it, looking at the social vulnerability index, which is from the American Community Survey. And it measures a community's chance to be negatively impacted by a stressor event. And I looked at the results for the social vulnerability index for all the participating counties in the farm to ECE program. And that was really a jarring experience for me because I really got to see the inequity between counties. For example, I don't know the exact percentage, but I think Warren County, which is a majority African-American county, I'm pretty sure, it has 
very high poverty rates, very high rates of unemployment, um, single parenthood compared to say, I think Randolph County, I might not be 100% sure with the names, but it's um, a county that doesn't have a high min minority percentage and it didn't have anything really too alarming in the social vulnerability index. So while making those tables, it really stuck out to me the inequity that exists and that as public administrators, we need to try to make better. Okay, thanks so much, Carl. Thanks for making that point. Um, you know, it is, um, has become quite popular, the social vulnerability index to measure sort of, as you met, mentioned, stressor events before, during, and after um, a natural disaster, a pandemic, you know, other kinds of culminating events for counties and communities, right? And so looking at um, what kind of resources are necessary to help, you know, stand up or provide support or American safety net for those communities is also oh, important. So thanks so much for sharing that. I wanted to um, pivot a little bit. There are a few of you who talked about Susan Gooden. Now I know that Dr. Gooden is not here, um, but she's here in spirit. So I just want to know what is it like to take a class with Susan Gooden? I know that, you know, this is sort of off topic, um, but I wonder if you could share a little bit with, you know, so what you really learn about social equity from the guru of social equity her book um, why um, not her book on um, race as a nervous area of government is really an important work in this space and so I wonder can you tell us a little bit about that seminal work and how it has had an impact on you if you've read the book I can go first um okay. I would say yes like when when I first um took a class with Dr. Gunny Dean Gooden we it was a first offer class, Social Equity in COVID-19, we actually took it at the height of COVID-19. And basically what we did for that class was focus on one of our areas of passion. So I kind of focus on the criminal justice system um, along with you know how that system agency or whatever was dealing with COVID-19. And we kind of had to create a path and analyze the problem and you know provide recommendations. So I did, you know, at that at that problem, at that time we were having Virginia was very overpopulated the prison system was and they were having issues with you know everybody in jail catching COVID and they really didn't know what mm -hmm. to do so using her book A Nervous Area of Government it really helped me lay down a foundation of just the intersectionality of race racial issues social equity issues you know um just all type of issues and how I could easily tie that into my subject. And then just seeing how that, how that intersectionality related to my peers topics as well. Like I had another student kind of do the digital divide before we were even really talking about the digital divide. So I believe like having her as a professor was just one of the best things. So it really introduced me to social equity. Um, I, I use her book as like my Bible whenever I need to refer to something in social equity or refer to something DEI. So I really think it helped me, you know, understand the importance of, like I said, checking my biases and checking my own privilege, as well as just what exactly social equity is and how we can apply it. Because I also think that's, that's the key. That's what everybody is missing. I think a lot of us know what social equity is, but mm -hmm. it's like, what's next? How do we apply it? How do we you know, how do we use it as an effective tool? Because I, what I've learned even from taking her classes and from social equity is just we're not in a post-racial world at all. Like, I think we see that every day and just how can, what kind of work can I do to make this world more effective? I think that's what that book really keeps me thinking. So. Sure. Thanks, Whitney. I appreciate that. You mentioned that, um, that one of the things you learned about um, and taking a class with Susan Gooden is really about how we define uh, social equity. I know at the National Academy of Public Administration, we have been working with a definition, which is really looking at the fair, just, and impartial treatment that are provided to 
all citizens, underserved citizens, um, resources, treatment, um, opportunities, all those kinds of things. And so really standing in the gap you know, between, I like to call it between the have and have nots, really understanding how we narrow that gap a little bit more is really a defining moment for social equity. Um, I also want to highlight, like, you know, being in Virginia, like, we call it the E word, because technically, we're not allowed to use the word equity anymore, especially in state government. So it's just, you know, having, how do you work in a space where you have to deal with those type of things, too? There's another mm-hmm. thing I think Dean Gooden taught us was that, you know, the historical implications of things. You're, you're not really able to understand equity until you understand the historical complexities that have come with it first. So. Yeah, thank you for uh, mentioning that, Whitney. In fact, um, in a presentation earlier this week, I think, Keandra, you were on that panel where we talked about language access in Virginia. Can you talk a little bit about your role on language access? And I mentioned it because there's a there was a Virginia commission on the legislative laws that were in the past creating inequities that we found in the practice of administration. There's also going to be a federal commission tomorrow at 12 o'clock Eastern time. I believe it's nine o'clock Pacific time. It's the um, commission on the social status of black men and boys. I hope that some of you will make time to uh, show up for that commission. We'll have representative Frederica Wilson, who's chairperson, who's chairwoman of that commission, as well as commissioner Calvin Johnson, who is uh, deputy assistant secretary of HUD, as well as um, the program manager, Uh, Mr. Williams, who works for um, the commission, as well as uh, works for the commission under the Office of Civil Rights. So I just shared all that to say, I hope you can make your, make some time to see, um, to see and hear and learn more about how commissions really help us chip away at either the big E um, or the little E, right, in terms of state practices. But Keandra, talk a little bit about about your language access services experience, um, if you will. Yeah, so um, um, like Dr. Jay was saying about like the joint commission. So I remember like, you know, kind of looking at our report. So the joint commission had actually come up um, with creating that plan back in 2004 um, to address language access um, because we know that um, about 14% of the um, population is represented as, as a black population um, in Virginia and where Hispanics make up you know, a little bit more than that. Um, but when we looked at some of the statistics for the disabled community and also what we consider LEP or limited English um, proficiency population, um, they're growing at an, acceler- an accelerating rate. Um, and we just, we, you, we found many just language access barriers um, across state agencies, across state agencies in Virginia, you know, at the federal level, um, you know, a, a little bit, some of them were on um, Department of Corrections, some of them were in, in DMVs, like you, we just saw a lot of issues, um, you know, with language access and just like the many barriers, but like specifically with the Joint Commission, so um, they wanted to create a plan back in 2004 to address some of these concerns, and that was dated all the way back in 2004, and just you know, looking at some of the data, like there were no existing plans on just how they were going to go about um, creating this plan, actually putting it into practice, um, you know, like Whitney said. And so that is definitely a discrepancy that you see a lot of, um, you know, sort of talking about these issues, um, you know, saying that we're going to address them, but then not actually putting that, putting those plans into practice. And so we saw many issues um, with that, like specifically with DMVs, um, you know, a lot of the complaints were, you know, with just exam materials, them not being in other languages besides of English. And so it's like, what do you do when you're having growing populations that are very diverse, um, but you're not meeting the needs of, of those that need them? Um, same thing with Department of Corrections in Virginia. They were actually ordered um, by the federal court um, a new plan by 2021 to implement um, regarding, um, you know, just many of the language access barriers that exist there. And so Virginia has, has experienced a lot of, um, you know, like lawsuits and reports with ACLU, um, Department of Health, um, really addressing those issues. And I think I think some of the things that really stuck with me were doing um, the literature reviews, um, you know, just looking at like best practices and just um, 
just I guess like more more um, barriers that LEP LED individuals face, and one of them was specifically with health. When we think about just like quality quality of care, of care um, and some of those things I found in the literature expressed, um, you know, just appointments or having to get operations done, and just for LEP groups having to wait months out. Um, just to hear back to have an appointment or to see the doctor or having to rely on your family to translate because again they're they're not represented in, in many of these spaces and so you know for many of us who were English might be our first language it's 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 easy for like we don't have to think about many of these issues and so you know working working in the language um, access plan you know was definitely an eye-opener um, and yeah it's it really just exposed many of the of these issues and I, I just I'm, I'm so glad that we continue to have these conversations and really next steps are figuring out what best practices and how to actually implement um, and do the work behind creating, you know, more equitable, more equitable resources for underserved communities. Yeah, thanks so much, Keandra. So I wanted to make sure that we had time to engage with our audience today. I think I was looking through some of our questions. We talked about um, what you've learned. We've talked about your role, the role you played um, in really broadening your understanding of uh, principles of DEI. We talked about your experiences as graduate students, research assistants. Um, we didn't talk about Paige's teaching assistant experiences. Paige, I wonder if you could broaden sort of, you know, what you do um, in, in your classes that you teach now, um, particularly as we think about diversity, equity, inclusion, social equity, and developing a sense of belonging. Could you share with us a little bit more? Of course, sorry, I'm getting over something, so. <clears throat> So, um, so I have been fortunate enough to teach a couple of different classes at NC State. Um, and so I've taught three different classes. And one of the things that I did, and I'll just talk about most, the most recent class that I taught was um, intro to public administration. And one of the big problems that I have with public administration, I would say, as a, even as a PhD student, is that when we start talking about foundations, of public administration of the discipline, we just glance over the problematic origins of the discipline itself. You know, we talk about Woodrow Wilson being like the father of public administration, and we completely glance over in his literature how he was um, teaching at a women's college and thought it was beneath him and thought that um, it was beneath him to teach women because they were less intelligent. And these kinds of biases find have found their way into our literature and find their way into um, the way that we interpret and implement different um, policies and the way that we implement different programs and that kind of thing. So we kind of glance over that, I think, a lot. Um, and we don't look at how our, the problematic origins of this. Um, and what I really learned in the program and learned in teaching and, and try to teach my students is that not only is public administration what our government and organizations decide to do, but it's also what we actively decide not to do. And public administrators have a very um, a pivotal role, not only in like implementing these programs, but designing the barriers that people experience every day. So one of the things that I did, and I know my, you know, I've got, I had students in my um, my last two classes this spring and this fall, and they, you know, they're tired of, and we all have been, you know, tired of living through a pandemic um, and talking about the pandemic. But I did a simulation with them, um, a survival simulation that was based off of. Um, that was based off of what happened uh, with Hurricane Katrina, kind of. Um, and basically what I did is I created where there were three different populations and all had um, all had equal, equal, equal populations, but then like some lived in low-lying areas, some had tribal governments, some had language barriers, and basically did a simulation where they had to, where a group had to create policies and create a response to um, a disaster and the disaster was a flood and then decide who to save and who not to save. And just based on the demographics and things and people living in low-lying areas, um, the, there are certain populations that had completely, that had all had perished in these populations by the end of the simulation. And um, you know, when you talk about how different populations are impacted differently by policies, um, I don't think that a lot of students realize that you know, this is something that is ongoing um, unless they've been the one that's experienced that personally. Um, and so, you know, actually having a simulation where you talk about how different populations that live in low-lying areas and, you know, that are usually going to be um, specifically people of color, 
um, and how they have experienced higher uh, mortality rates due to um, these barriers and things and just due to government neglect. Um, I think that that really drove it home. And for some of them, that was very, very eye-opening. But, you know, I tried to uh, engage and, you know, put these different values of social equity in my projects, my writing, my research, my teaching, um, because we, I think that we neglect to, um, you know, we're talking about uh, Gooden. And, you know, Gooden has said that, you know, when we look at the values of efficiency, effectiveness, and equity, one of the failures of public administration is that we have yet to establish equity as an equal pillar to these other values. And we've been studying equity for a long time, and we've been experiencing inequities for a long time. Um, and so we have to do better than that moving forward in, you know, how we teach public administration, how we deliver public administration. And so when we talk about, um, you know, preparing public administrators and the people that are going to come to grad school after me, um, you know, I've always tried to instill those, those uh, promote, how, how do we promote equity every day as public administrators? Thanks so much, Paige. Thanks so much for sharing that. You know, you all have done a great job really talking about how um, you learn about equity, how you engage in equity, and how you teach equity. I want to open up, if you will, to um, our, our group here. We have a small group, so small enough where we can have some deep um, conversations. I uh, hope it's okay if people in the audience ask you questions. Actually, I want to call on um, Dr. E. I call her Dr. E. Emily Waputa was a master's student um, at North Carolina State University also and went on to um, complete her PhD at the University of uh, UNC Chapel Hill in public policy. And she's now at the University of um, University of Texas Arlington as a faculty member. Dr. E, are you still on the line or are you just um, listening and doing a couple different things? <laughs> I'm on the line. Awesome. Hi, yeah, no, I've been listening. Um, I am uh, a little bit of a background. I'm, I'm currently going to teach F excuse me, methods in the fall. But even with that, that doesn't mean I let go of the social equity lens on the work. And so um, I was listening for my own purposes because I'm trying to understand what is impactful for students um, as they get to engage with um, social equity directly or indirectly. Um, and then I don't want to belabor the point, but I never want to um, diminish the uh, importance. So my question to you guys is, um, given what you know, um, what aspects of social equity, um, whether that be a hard skill or just a, um, a reinforced belief, do you plan to um, incorporate into your um, future careers, <laughs> right? Um, I knew I was gonna go into academia um, I knew I was going to get a PhD even when I was a master's student. I knew I was going to try to become a, uh, look for a tenure track position. Um, and even then, I did not know how I was going to incorporate uh, social equity into anything other than research, but I'm, 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 I'm finding new opportunities to branch out. So um, just to anyone, if you have any thoughts around how you could um, explicitly incorporate um, social equity into your future careers. Carl, did you want to take that question? Sure. Well, I'm not 100% certain still so, uh, my exact job I'll have after I graduate. I do plan on, not just plan, I will consider and look over research data before making decisions if, and it will be, if equity is something that should be considered and if the policy I'm administrating needs to have special considerations regarding equity, it's hard for me to speak specifically since I haven't actually done any of it yet, but I will take it into account when, as I mentioned, I didn't know really much about DI before coming to NCSU. I wouldn't have given it much consideration, but now I will definitely review it before decision making. Thanks, Carl. And then Whitney, you talked a little bit about um, equity being the E word, 
right? Um, we want to talk a little bit about how does an e-word show up in everyday policy making, everyday implementation, if you're not even allowed to talk about it? We can't hear you, Whitney. Okay, Whitney, try one more time. Can't hear you. It's the oddest thing sometimes. Kendra, could you, can, can we hear you? Can, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we could hear okay. Kendra. Okay. So, so hold on to your thoughts, Whitney. I'm going to pivot to Keandra. Keandra, want to talk a little bit about what you're planning on doing this summer with the policy academies, um, particularly as you're thinking about making sure that equity um, uh, shows up in the work that you'll be doing? Yeah, definitely. So I just started the Kaijakazi Research Fellowship, um, and it focuses on and it focuses on um, race and wealth inequality. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's such an important um, topic right now. And it's with the Office of Social Insurance. So they do a lot of work with um, work compensation, unemployment, disability. And so, you know, really important work. And I feel like it's it's one that's so important, but it's often not discussed enough. Um, and, you know, we've, we've all been talking about just how the racial wealth the racial wealth gap is, is, is widening. You know, mm -hmm. we're seeing how federal policy, specifically federal housing policy, um, you know, in, impacted a lot of this and just a lot of these outcomes that we're seeing. Um, and so social equity is actually in all of the elements of what I'll be doing um, this summer in the fellowship. And just like, honestly, like my, my um, research um, and career paths in general, um, you know, really creating that voice and directly through research and through policy and in practice, um, you know, for those communities, because again, like we said, our, our, our populations are growing, they're diversifying a lot more. And it's like, we, we have to create um, resources and tools um, for these community groups. And so I think, I think um, going back to like the initial question of mm -hmm. how to create how to create social equity and when you're in a place where you can't, I think like finding ways to do it, like I, um, um, when I took my social equity course at FSU, an issue that we always talked about was, you know, again, social equity is the fourth pillar of public administration, but why is social equity only offered as an elective course? Like it should be required. Um, like Paige mentioned, you know, because I didn't even know that about Woodrow Wilson. So we've been taught, we really have been talking about social equity for a long time, but for some reason, we only focus on those three E's in public administration. And so I think a lot of things like just looking at a lot of the frameworks, um, you know, they're they're dated, and we we have to do a lot of improvement in that. And so I think finding finding those small ways um, to create that voice, whether it be reading more articles to like in the research methods course to that are um, discuss social inequities that can expose students, especially because um, again, it's not required. So the only people that will that will have these encounters have this exposure are those that seek it out. So if you're not interested, if you don't already know about it you won't have access to it. And I think it's honestly like the largest problem right now in, our, in policy because of um, people not having those exposures and things like CRT and all these things that um, kind of push back and prevent us from advancing in this way, which again, um, best supports these community groups. So yeah, it's just like finding, finding small ways and even in practice, um, talking to your, your talking to directors, having those meetings um, to really put that voice out there and express the need and why this is so important because it's like um, a, a, a student, we had a health, um, a PhD student that was in health policy currently, and she talked about some of the, the issues, like again, with public administration only focusing on effectiveness um, and efficiency. And she was like, without equity, like having, creating more equitable resources and tools impacts, it, it affects all of us. Like there's better outcomes for all of us as an entire community, not just certain ones. And so I think really looking at it from a larger lens, um, I think, and yeah, just creating, creating that voice in whatever space that you're in. Um, yes. Yeah, thanks, Keandra. I um, want to give Whitney a chance to, if your mic is working. Yeah, can you hear me now? Oh, yes, we can. Okay, okay. So yes, yeah, so you asked me about the E word um, and I just wanted to reflect like, I don't have much of the problem now since I'm not with state government. However, you know, Virginia is a Dillon state. So um, let me know if you don't know what that means. 
So, you know, a lot of what comes down from the state affects us at the local level. Um, and, you know, the fact that the state really is trying to now kind of sway away from equity, I really feel like it's undoing a lot of the great work that Virginia did, because I'm sure all of you know, and I've even worked with Dr. Underwood, but um, Dr. Underwood was the first cabinet level position in the nationally to be like chief diversity officer, like that type of, you know, position, just a position, mm -hmm. really focused on equity and diversity and inclusion. And it did a lot of great things for Virginia. You know, Virginia was the best state for business and Virginia just did a lot of great things. But I think the fact that, you know, we have some people who don't want to use the word equity and who don't really like it because they believe it's a device diverse concept. I just don't think they know what it means. So just like, you know, Keandra kind of talked about education and wanting to, you know, understand those things. I just think we need to people, first of all, you have to be open to these concepts and open and open to listening um, and learning. Because I think, you know, to advance social equity, it is both a give and take, like, you know, we're going to be forever learners and forever teachers of this type of framework. So I think that that's just where I would start with that. All right. Thank you so much, Whitney. I'm glad you got your mic to work. I think you shared some important advice that we're all learners and teachers, particularly as we advance equity in our own generation. Thanks so much for making that point. I do see that we probably have time for just one more, um, one more question. Stephanie Garcia, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, not so much a question, but just wanted to sort of chime in to what Keandra Davis is mentioning in regards to like um, just how like equity and um, is sort of an inclusion is sort of and sorry give me one sec um, how um, how is so difficult when you're in academia or in different academic spaces in those professors or institute don't really reflect you or, you know, um, don't reflect a very inclusive or diverse space. And I, I, I was just thinking because, you know, just like from, from my personal experience, I went to undergrad at the University of San, Fran uh, San Francisco State, I mean, and um, for our poli-sci department, we only had one woman of color who was Latino, and we had, like, no um, Black professors or no, you know, like, so it was just really hard for me to sort of, you know, feel um, sort of represented in that space and if it was it was a very um, hard space to navigate to because a lot of the professors were white males and we don't really talk about the challenges that come within being in those spaces and how we really need to work on just diversifying those spaces so um, yeah I just wanted to chime in on that and um, thank you for bringing that up Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thanks for making that point that, um, you know, nothing without us um, is, is the thing or the moniker that comes in mind, you know, for us and by us, but not without us. And so that's really my equity principle at work. It looks like we are at the end of our session. I think our session is supposed to end at 2.30 today. Um, on behalf of the 28. 22 Social Equity Leadership Conference and the uh, conference track Innovative Public Service Pedagogy to Foster Enhanced Social Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. And on behalf of these wonderful students um, who provided true insight on our guided discussion using research opportunities to develop graduate student competencies in social equity. I just want to say thank you so much for attending this session. I want to thank you very much for um, making sure that we had the space to talk about equity, not only based on you know, how we experience it, but how we work toward it, and also how we um, think about our research approaches with respect to um, a sense of belonging. Any other, anyone else wanna have any, share any comment, uh, parting comments? Keandra? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, no, go ahead. 
no, 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 you guys were great. I just wanted to push back a little bit. Avoid the idea of only making small contributions, right? I'm a 2020 graduate, by the way, and you'd be surprised um, how equity does not come up and folks um, have no need to bring it up, right? And it's, it's us who's been trained. It's us who are the younger generation. Um, a, a lot of onus will be on you <laughs> to bring it up, not just as an option, but as a must. And um, that's just a reality. So good luck to all of you in your studies and, and completing your work. But be aware of that, that um, you could be working with folks two, three generations older than you. And um, a lot of times it, it, it's up to you to bring it into the conversation as well as make it a reality. Awesome. Well, thanks, Dr. E. We're going to let you have that last word. Appreciate you very much. I think it's time to pivot on to the next session. I don't want to make a 